This episode has been brought to you by Surfshark. Concept cars. The type of car that shows you the future is here. Or is it? Are they the showstoppers of tomorrow, today, or simply empty promises on four wheels? Welcome everyone to a retro-futuristic 48th episode of the Automotive History series, where we're going to take a closer look at the past of the future, the history of the concept car. The concept car is a type of car that sits somewhere in the early stages of development from idea to production car, usually after sketches, mock-ups and clay models, but before prototypes and later on actual production vehicles. And yet the purpose of a concept car may vary. In essence, a concept car is always designed to test new revolutionary or high-tech features, or the newest and boldest exterior and interior designs, where the car company keeps in mind it'll never reach actual production. These are more or less the functional concept cars that never leave the design department, so more like a design study. But there are also concept cars that do the same thing, but are specifically designed for just showing off. For showing off the capabilities of a car maker. For presenting on car shows. For generating publicity and enthusiasm. For reeling in prospective buyers. For gauging reaction. And yet these cars will also never enter production, or it rarely happens. Because in order to make a concept car ready for production, it has to go through the many stages of homologation. The concept car has to meet all kinds of safety standards, emission standards, and usually the materials it's made out of, or features it displays, are far too expensive to mass produce. But then again, a car maker may choose how far it wants to go in making a concept car production ready. Some concept cars that were made in the past were actually fitted with an engine. All in all, concept cars are there to make you excited for what is yet to come, without ever delivering the thing it actually promises. But where did this practice of making a car that promises a lot but delivers nothing actually start? Get this! You are at a local car show admiring some of the great cars and suddenly a stranger comes up to you and starts selling all kinds of your very own personal details. How would you react? Exactly. So why do you keep giving your valuable personal information on the internet to random companies? Get a VPN connection today with Surfshark. Surfshark allows you to browse the internet anonymously so that companies cannot track your activities or collect personal data. But it's not just privacy, you know. When using Surfshark VPN, you get past geo-blocks and government restrictions, easily access an unblocked streaming platform so that you can watch your favorite TV shows that were otherwise not available in your country, save money. Remember that time when the price of online air flight tickets had gone up again since the last time you searched for them? Well, not anymore, if you use Surfshark. Companies can no longer fiddle with the price if they can't see that you searched for them in the first place. Uh-huh. Get secure, save money, and enhance your streaming experiences by getting Surfshark VPN subscription now. Click on the link in the description to serve the shark and use the special Ad Solder Reviews promo code to get 83% off and get three extra months for free. No risk involved, and if it turns out you are scared of sharks after all, then Surfshark offers you a 30-day money-back guarantee. So, what are you waiting for? Get invisible, get secure, get Surfshark. Concept cars are an integral part of the process of designing a car. So in order for concept cars to appear, a car maker should pay attention to the design of a car. And that brings me to a story I have told before. In the first 30 years of its existence, passenger cars featured a strictly functional design. The cars looked the way they looked because it was nothing more than the composition of its parts. The design of the cars only changed if some of the parts were updated. For instance, a new type of headlight, or a grille cover, or a bumper would change the design. This started to change in the 1930s. Some car makers actually saw that the market was getting saturated. There was no real need for people to buy a new car every couple of years, because they didn't change that much, externally at least. So how could you, as a car maker, convince the buying public otherwise? Well, why not use the exterior design as a marketing tool? 
annual design changes. So your customers still don't really need to buy a new car every so often, but hey, they also didn't want to be seen driving an older model and be considered old fashioned or God forbid, out of touch. Car manufacturers set up design departments to not only design the car components, but also start to actively think and pay attention about exterior design, preferably that of the future. And so these car makers would meet each other every year on the car shows to show their new designs of the new year. But gosh darn it, everyone has come up with a new design. And so it's a logical next step to say, hey, what if we just make one car that looks completely out of this world? We'll put it in the center of our exhibition at the show so that it will grab attention of anyone passing by. It doesn't even matter if it actually works or not, if it has an engine or not. As long as it generates publicity and sales, then the job is done. And this leads to the discussion of what was the very first concept car. Generally it's accepted that General Motors and the chief of the design department Harley Earl came up with the idea of making an empty promise vehicle and show it to the public and also brand it as a concept car. Although there are a few other cars that can also claim that title, like the Auburn Cabin Speedster and the Volvo Venus Billow, but this will end in a semantic discussion on when a car is a concept car and when a car is a prototype that actually works. Uh, well, I'll leave it up to you in the comment section to decide. The Buick Wide Job from 1938 is often regarded as the very first concept car, and I had the utmost rare pleasure to actually see it with my own eyes. Lo and behold, the car was quite ahead of its time. It featured several gimmicks and styling touches that were truly revolutionary, like hidden headlights. This was not new, there were some other cars that had them before, but these were the first power-operated hidden headlights. And power-operated hidden headlights only became popular some 20 years later. It also had electric windows, and now that's a first. The first regular production car to have power windows was a Packard in 1940, so two years later. And it also had wraparound bumpers. And this was also kind of first. Most bumpers in 38 were still flat metal bars. But let's talk about my favorite aspect, the design. Because the Y job, I guess Earl had run out of access, was a true concept car in that it accurately predicted the future car design. Let me show you. If you'd park a Buick Wide Job next to a regular Buick from the same year, it's all too obvious. Longer, wider, lower, headlights fully integrated in the front fenders, and no running boards. But when you park the Wide Job next to a 1948 Buick, it all starts to make sense. The cars kinda look the same. This just shows that the Wide Job was a full 10 years ahead in its design. Subtract 5 years of industry standstill because of the war and it's still 5 years ahead of all the other cars out there. With the Second World War in the way, most if not all car shows were getting scrapped, so there was no need to make concept cars at all. And after the war it would take car makers a few years to get up to speed again and return to normal. But by 1950 all bets were off. General Motors had given the world a little taste of the future through a radical car and was ready to do it again. The Le Sabre concept was kind of like the spiritual successor of the Y job and once again I had the rare pleasure to see it with my own eyes. The Le Sabre introduced new features and styling gimmicks that would dominate the industry in the future years. Namely the countless design tricks borrowed from the aircraft and space industry. It was the space race rage age after all. Heck, it just looks like a space rocket on wheels. Other American car makers quickly followed GM and released their concept cars with the wildest ideas about the future in the following years. And it was only getting more radical as the 50s progressed. One was more bizarre and outlandish than the other. But I think I'll dedicate a separate episode about these 50s dream cars. And although concept cars were a standard practice for the Americans, the rest of the world also caught up with the car craze. But whereas the Americans created one fantasy dream car after another, in Europe the concept cars were a bit more concrete and were more or less designed to see if the proposals would stick with the buying public or not. And this buying public was growing each year. Especially the Italians know how to design beautiful cars, and especially the Italian coach builders and design firms took an interest in the emerging concept car as a, a, a concept. Bertone went to work to create several concept cars for Alfa Romeo. These cars were nicknamed the BAT models, Berlina Aerodynamica Technica. 
These cars featured smooth lines and massive fins that they almost looked like some sort of fish, kind of like a manta ray. The design of the cars looked the way they looked as it was Bertone that tried to design the cars with the lowest drag coefficient possible. See? Americans put fins on cars just for show. Europeans do it to actually get something out of it. After reaching peak space age around 1960, like this Cadillac Cyclone, the world moved forward. The 60s in general can be seen as the performance era, where the sports car became more affordable and in reach of the everyday man. The Coke bottle styling also made its debut. Cars like the Plymouth XNR, the early design studies for the up-and-coming Ford Mustang, and the Dutch Charger concept cars show the typical Coke bottle lines. By the late 60s, it were companies like Lamborghini that once again shifted concept car design. The flowing lines of the Coke bottle styling were out, and the hard angles of the wedge-shaped design were in. The 1968 Lamborghini Marzal, once again designed by Bertone, was radical in many ways. Wedge shape, glass doors and the rectangular headlights deep inserted in slim horizontal grille. Many other companies took over the styling cues and, and the best and the most radical of all is arguably the French Citroën Caron concept car that essentially is a glass pyramid on wheels that would make even the most demanding Faroe proud. It's also the car with the smallest roof surface ever. It's just the size of an A3 sheet of paper. By the late 60s and the early 70s, the concept cars were still very much showing off engineering and design capabilities. And occasionally, a radical new type of body style would come along. But this all started to change by the 1970s. During this period, a strong focus on fuel efficiency and vehicle safety emerged. Partly thanks to oil crises and also a shifting public opinion. Cars had to be more safe, fuel efficient and less harmful to the environment food for thought for the car makers and a new way to spend their development money on. The concept cars of the 70s not only showed new advanced designs but also revolutionary safety equipment. Equipment that for once was not out of this world because much of the equipment that was ultra expensive on the concept cars are now standard equipment on passenger cars today. And a great example is the Volvo VESC or Volvo Experimental Safety Car. And yes, I also had the pleasure to see this car with my own eyes. The VESC offers numerous safety gadgets like massive safety bumpers, state-of-the-art crumple zones, front and rear airbags, anti-lock brakes, backup warning signal, three-point seat belts, and get this, a backup camera which sends its footage to an interior TV screen. And today, nobody would bet an eye. This is all standard stuff on cars today, but for your average 70s death trap, this was truly revolutionary. By the mid-1980s, after years of blocky and rectangular car design, engineers found a new way to make cars even more fuel efficient, by designing them to be more aerodynamic. This led to a big change in car design, where the hard angles were replaced by soft surfaces. By the mid-80s, concept cars showed what the cars in the 1990s would look like. And by the 1990s, most regular production cars adopted the soft and curvy aerodynamic trends. The 1980s are also known as the decade of the computer tech, where more and more electronic components found their way into cars, like engine management systems, but also computer screens in the interior. Car designers tried to reinvent interior space by cleaning up the dashboard and put all the controls whether physical buttons or a screen, or sometimes even a touchscreen, into the steering wheel, or in the immediate area around it. By the 90s, especially towards the new millennium, car companies celebrated their rich histories by making concept cars that were, of course, futuristic, but sometimes with a touch of the good old days in it. The Hyundai Euro 1 harks back to the golden years of the concept car, the 50s and the 60s. It belongs to yesterday's tomorrow. Whether it was Chrysler with the neoclassic Atlantic in 1995, or the retro-futuristic Lincoln Sentinel in 1996, or whatever this is made by Renault in 1992. The concept cars were pretty diverse, now with even more shapes and sizes, like massive minivans, but also rise in ultra-concept personal transportation, so more a pot-like style that can seat either one or two people for inner-city use. And laugh about all these concepts all you want, a decade or so later, it actually became real. 
As of today, the practice of making a concept car is still common practice. Although showing your concept car on car shows has been declining as car shows in general are getting smaller or cancelled. So it's interesting to see what role a concept car is going to play in the future when less and less people get to see them. And yet we have been treated on some fantastic concept cars in the recent years. BMW has made a car that can change its own shape and also made a car that can somehow change its color. This is truly what a concept car is about. It doesn't make any sense. You don't really get an advantage over anything. And for now, I guess it's also very complicated and expensive to make, especially for regular production. But hey, it's just to show off. And who knows, as I've demonstrated in this entire video, what seems way too futuristic now might become common practice 20 years later. Okay, so a car maker has gone through a lot of time and money to make a car that is never going to enter regular production, but it has done its magic by attracting new buyers and generating publicity on the car shows. Now what? It's an industry standard to just destroy these pieces of art after showing them at the shows. And you'd scream that that is a real shame, but car makers have some solid reasons to do this. First of all, it's intellectual property. Many of these concepts show radical technology only developed by the respective car maker. If the concept car somehow ends up in the hands of a competitor, then they can steal the technology and use it to their own advantage. Second is that the law doesn't care if it's a concept car. It's a car after all. And if a concept car manages to get on the road and cause an accident because the concept car doesn't function properly since it's missing vital parts, then the car maker is held accountable and responsible. Better be careful and limit the risk by not letting them onto the open road. The last reason is that showing a concept and then hiding it again can create an air of exclusivity, which I also experienced firsthand when I saw the Lesaber with my own eyes. You just know you can't touch it. It's the only one in the world and parts are irreplaceable. Once again, better be careful, but good grief did I find myself cool standing next to it. And although I said most of the concept cars get destroyed, some of them are locked away in warehouses, only to come out for exhibitions in museums or shows. Some of them end up at the scrapyard. Rarely a car designer manages to actually save one. And even if he succeeds, the company will turn a blind eye, but only if he promises not to drive it out in the open. There are very few regular people in the world that manage to get their hands on concept cars either through sheer luck or massive fortune. And that brings me to the last thing I want to discuss, and I'd like to call this the concept car paradox. Let me explain. Concept cars are all about the future, right? Well, I think that a concept car from a certain period tells us more about that period than about the future it was trying to represent. Let me give you a non-car example. This is one of those postcards from 1900 when they predicted the year 2000, so a century away. Now, we see this and think, ah, what a nonsense. They put books in a meat grinder and somehow the information gets stored in the human brain through wires. But what if I told you that we have a machine kind of like this? Huh? And that's what I mean. This postcard isn't all that far off with its prediction. Only the shape and form of this prediction is based on what was considered standard at the time. It tells more of how people looked at the way things were designed in 1900 than in 2000. And the same goes for concept cars. If you want to understand the aesthetics of a certain period in time, take a look at the concept cars. I can't get enough of this. For instance, people thought that it would drive rockets in the future, but now it looks more quintessentially 1950s than a regular passenger car of those days. Concept cars look like they are more in tune with their own time than the future time they were trying to represent.